Well, like everyone else who has appeared on this platform, I'd like to begin by expressing my great uh, gratitude to be able to be here to speak in honor of Charles Taylor. I was never Charles Taylor's student, but I was one of those people who, in, when they were doing their graduate work, stumbled upon one of his articles. In my case, it was Interpretation in the Sciences of Man, and the world changed. Charles Taylor is the most incisive theorist of cultural difference of our time. His work has been, as Alain's introduction mentioned, been shaped by intensive engagement in and extensive reflection upon the distinctively Canadian challenges of bilingualism in the place of Quebec within Canada. But of course, he has also spoken insistently and well to an international audience. There's hardly a debate over issues of cultural difference that has not been marked by his 1992 essay, The Politics of Recognition. Largely because of that essay, recognition has become the master concept through which these issues are debated. And that is a pity. <laughs> Charles Taylor is the most incisive theorist of cultural difference, but not because of recognition and not because of his contributions to our understanding of that concept. His most important contributions lie in a combination of his conception of humanity as self-interpreting animals, his ruminations on the role of language, and his use of language as an analogy for other forms of cultural difference, and his exploration of the conditions of dialogue across cultures on the uh, language of perspicuous contrast. His most important publication on cultural difference, then, is not the politics of recognition, but the two volumes of philosophical papers. It is those ideas that lie at the foundation of all of the amazing books and papers that have followed. And in this talk, I'll be making the case for the primacy of those hermeneutical contributions, and will attempt to put the work on recognition in its place. Now, one of the things that I'm certainly doing in this paper is correcting what seems to me a frequent misinterpretation of the politics of recognition. It's often interpreted as though recognition were the foundational concept, entirely self-sufficient, so that Taylor's hermeneutical foundations are ignored in the interpretation of that essay. And there's certainly much more than that going on in the essay. But I have to say that I'm not sure that I, whether I am just engaged in a reinterpretation of that argument. Uh, Taylor is a master of erecting a very large tent and then assembling a multitude inside. Uh, and so I'm not entirely sure that I don't find myself inside that tent with people that I'm disagreeing with. Whether, uh, whether Charles Taylor would include those others within the tent that I think perhaps, uh, those views that I, I perhaps think don't fit, um, but we'll see. I'll, sh I'll show you what I mean later in the paper, um, but let's start with what I see as the shortcomings of recognition in understanding what is an issue in claims of cultural accommodation. And to be clear by claims of cultural accommodation, I'm primarily concerned, as Taylor has been, with arguments that political structure should be premised upon, should be adapted to certain kinds of cultural difference. The kinds of issues that underlie the debate over the place of Quebec within Canada uh, and that are central to questions of the relationship between French and English in Canada. Now my fundamental argument will be that unlike a concern, uh, sorry, that while a concern for recognition certainly is part of many cultural conflicts, that it serves as a poor master concept for analyzing those conflicts and resolving them. Now, Axel Honneth, whose work has also been influential on recognition, certainly uses recognition as a master concept in the way that I'm criticizing. Taylor, I don't think, does so. Well, to begin with, it's important, I think, to distinguish two different ways in which recognition is used. First, it's often used as a catch-all for all forms of cultural accommodation, so that one recognizes, for example, a minority language group, 
by creating minority language schools. Or one recognizes indigenous governance, indigenous uh, governmental autonomy by allowing the existence or enabling the existence of indigenous governance. Now that kind of catch-all, where essentially recognition is used as, as a uh, synonym for cultural accommodation is not what I mean here. I'm referring to a narrower usage of recognition, where it's meant specifically to deal with acts of symbolic affirmation, attributions of value of one party to another, perhaps also the projection of a particular description or image onto the other party. And the distinguishing feature in this narrower use of recognition is that the focus is on the impact of those actions on the self-image of the recipient. Does the recipient feel affirmed? Does the recipient feel denigrated? And on this view, it's a search, it is the search for an appropriate relation to self, in Hanna's language, that drives the process of accommodation forward. Right? And that's certainly the case with Hanath. Indeed, the striving for recognition in this sense, for Hanath, drives the entire development of normative evolution forward in a good neo-Hegelian fashion. Okay, well it seems to me that there are three problems with this approach to recognition. First, it tends to ignore the substance of minorities' claims. Indeed, it gets, often gets that substance wrong, it seems to me. It tries to translate all those claims into one fungible property, a concern with self-regard. But in doing so, it includes the very real interests that minorities are often asserting. A lingui linguistic minority, for example, wants to have schools in its own language, wants to have governmental services in, in its own language. Even more, wants the ability to participate fully in political life in its own language. A religious minority wants, for example, its method of slaughtering meat to be permitted, not forbidden by law. Or an indigenous people wants to be able to govern itself on its lands. And surely it's misleading to treat all of these interests, and kind of narcissistic to treat all of these interests, as though they were only about the cultivation of a positive self-image in the other's eyes. Groups care about the very specific measures. Indeed, they may well prefer to obtain those measures from a bored, uncomprehending, <laughs> uninterested majority than to have genuine and heartfelt expressions of respect, but no schools, no religious accommodation, and no control over their lands. Or to put it another way, the claim to those things is not just a reaction to a lack of respect. Now, sometimes minorities do feel as though their self-esteem is under assault, so I don't mean to exclude that entirely by any means, but it seems to me that it's often, very often, a secondary phenomenon, a consequence of these other things being denied the fact that one's language cannot be used in the political debates of the society. So that's the first problem. A second problem with recognition. By trying to abstract from these specific concerns and treating everything as essentially a search for self-esteem, it seems to me that it renders the conflicts themselves much more difficult to resolve. One gets into arguments over relative degrees of recognition. Uh, when, uh, it's even difficult to determine who should be entitled to recognition because of course there's always groups within groups. Should they all be recognized? Should they be recognized in the same way? And it seems to me that a focus on self-esteem alone provides insufficient basis for distinguishing between groups in the process of recognition. And what specific kind of recognition is appropriate for each of the groups. And in, fee, in fact, one sees the impact of the, la, the loss of definition of claims, it seems to me, in the work, uh, in Sheila Ben-Habib's work, The Claims of Culture. She accepts the Taylor, Taylorian view that identity is determined dialogically. But she notes, rightly, 
that people engage in a whole series of different contexts and form their identities through a whole series of interactions. Uh, and if recognition alone for, for self-esteem alone is an issue, who has a right to choose among those different contexts except the individual, him or herself? And in fact, in Sheila Ben Habib's work, uh, she provides no real basis at all for doing so. In fact, she's quite resistant to the idea that government can build policy around any of these particular identities. Now, closely related to that objection is, I think, a third one, which I won't develop, but which uh, Charles Taylor develops extraordinarily well in the politics of recognition. And that's the incoherence of the, su the, su the suggestion that one might have a right to recognition. As Taylor indicates, an obligatory recognition is no recognition at all. Right? Rather than being a genuine attribution of, of worth, it's a patronizing pseudo-recognition. And it seems to me that that's very t closely related to the subtraction from the particular substantive concerns that are being asserted. In fact, it seems all to me that all these problems stem from the disregard if recognition is taken as the master concept for the particularity of the claims that are being made. The failure to grapple with the particular uh, uh, assertions um, and the inability to assess the substantive claims being made on behalf of the culture or the belief. And Taylor gives us tools, wonderful tools, for understanding and sifting precisely those claims. Those tools, in fact, are evident in the politics of recognition itself. It is true that in the politics of recognition, Taylor is particularly drawn to teasing out and understanding cases where symbolic of affirmation tends to be particularly pronounced. The distinct society clause is one of those, um, although I think it's also important, and I'm sure Charles Taylor would agree, that treating it as a merely symbolic recognition uh, just did, would not get the point. Um, now, there ha are points in the essay where, uh, where Taylor assimilates nationalism to, nationalism to the desire for self-esteem, and I have to say that that strikes me as, as too simple. Um, and I can't help wondering whether Taylor drawing on Herder is sometimes attracted to a purely expressivist conception of identity that is manifested in the search for relative status in nationalism. And, I, and that, I think, is behind the focus on self-esteem that I, I want to resist. But there's no doubt that there's also much more going on in the politics of, differ, uh, of recognition. I've already mentioned that he sees a right to recognition as being uh, incoherent. A number of his central examples have to do with the substantive claims of the parties, not with a simple craving for esteem. So for example, in the penultimate section of the politics of recognition, Taylor is looking at Quebec's concern for the survival of French and the capacity to maintain a predominantly French-speaking society, the concern with survivance, and that, of course, is an internal commitment of Quebecers to maintenance of their language and culture. Um, and Taylor is concerned very much to argue the compatibility of that with a coherent conception of liberalism. But if one thinks about it, there's very little of self-esteem in that. It's about the capacity of a society to identify the preservation of French as a goal of that society and to be able to maintain that and still consider itself a liberal society. But the most important departure from a simplistic conception of recognition comes, in fact, in the first section of that essay when Taylor is setting up his argument. He notes that we become full human agents in dialogue with others. But this dialogue is not simply, as it is, for example, in Hanna's work, about their conferral of esteem on us, not simply about an affirmation of a pre-existing identity, identity. Rather, those relationships with others are significant, uh, first and above all for Taylor, 
because, as Taylor says, they give us a language. It is the struggle for meaning, for self-understanding, not merely self-respect, that is most important. And that struggle is conceived in relational terms precisely because we draw upon the realm of interaction, upon goods that are created and maintained intersubjectively, specifically upon language and upon conversation in order to develop our self-understanding. And that brings us directly to the hermeneutical foundation for Taylor's conception of intercultural interaction. Taylor, of course, sees humanity as quintessentially self-interpreting animals. And that self-interpretation operates not just at the individual level, but at the level of our communities, as we seek to identify what our community stands for, what should be maintained and deepened within our lives in community, what should be jettisoned. And engaging in those reflections at both the individual and collective level, we cannot help but draw upon specific languages. We use a particular natural language or languages to express our aspirations. We draw upon its conceptual structure, its terms. We conduct our deliberations in that language. And over time, we develop a history of deliberations, of ways of posing the questions, a stock of past answers to the question. And indeed, we have a distinctive set of historical reference points, distinctive sets of practices, a body of experience against which our interpretations are framed. These ma languages matter deeply to us. They provide the medium through which we have expressed our deepest understandings of ourselves and of our societies. They provide the terms in which we have framed our political aspirations. There is a very real benefit then to being able to use those languages, the languages that we have mastered, and to have our expressions in those languages reflected in our political lives. And there's a corresponding disadvantage if we have to work always within somebody else's terms. If the normative languages that mean so much to us have no currency in our political institutions. We have an interest, in other words, in having our political structures adjusted so that the debates that use our language have an impact on the decisions that govern our lives. We have an interest in having those decisions worked out within a framework that is intelligible, that uses concepts that we ourselves use. And that, it seems to me, is the most basic reason to have political institutions adapted to our languages. And note that it has very little to do with a craving for self-respect or a sense of self-worth. Or at least, our concern with self-respect is entirely dependent on a more substantive interest, our capacity to participate as full citizens in that society. The value of us having our debates using intelligible examples and concepts reflected in the norms by which we're governed. Note, too, that it provides a basis for dis distinguishing which forms of cultural difference justify this level of political, this kind of political structure. Unlike recognition of self esteem that does not provide any such criteria, this does. It suggests that there should be some rough match between communities of political deliberation, which, use, which occur within particular languages, and political structure. Natural languages clearly have that kind of structuring role, which is why language has been so crucial to Canadian constitutional debates. But even within natural languages, there can be normative discourses with substantial autonomy of this kind. I do a lot of work in connection with indigenous governance. Many indigenous peoples have either lost their language or the use, language use is severely attenuated within those communities. But there's still no doubt that those communities use substantially different 
terms to deal with issues of fem familial relationship, to deal with relationship to the land. They have different historical reference points. They're grounded in different practical pr uh, practices with respect to the land or with respect to familial relations. And in a, if autonomous structures don't exist, where decisions grounded in those languages can be expressed, it of course can be profoundly alienating. One can have a theoretical commitment to being Cree or being Anishinaabek or being Niska, but no practical way to actualize that. So one can, and it seems to me that one can also make the case that there are other, that one is always living within uh, communities and sub-communities. Political communities also transcend those boundaries. And Taylor has given us a wonderful picture of what is necessary to do that too. Our languages are not hermetically sealed. Indeed, Taylor deeply values, as I do, one unique political community, Canada, that has, as, at its best, crossed those boundaries, drawing on both. And Taylor gives us tools for dealing with that too, in the notion of the language of perspicuous contrast that's framed against this ideal of a fusion of horizons. And I should make clear that I think it's important that it be seen as being an ideal of perfect understanding that we never quite achieve. And indeed, if you see the fusion of the relevant horizons as being practices of deliberation and discussion, one may well not want to achieve a perfect fusion. One may well want to allow, to embrace, a continued autonomy of those horizons while still thinking of fusion of, hori fusion of horizons as an ideal understanding that what might aspire to in conversations across those boundaries. And it, but in any case, that what does it do? It presupposes a relev relative autonomy of the two languages of understanding. It notes the distinct resources, the distinctive insights that are carried by, by those languages. And it recognizes the difficult apprenticeship involved in any significant attempt to converse across those boundaries. So it seems to me that the vision that emerges out of this is a fundamentally federal version where one has zones of autonomy as well as fostering interaction. Now, very briefly then, where does recognition fit into this? It is true that in some circumstances, a concern with relative status can become pronounced, can become the focus of our political debates. It can dominate certain struggles. And when it does, it renders those conflicts very difficult to resolve. As a descriptive matter then, claims to relative status can be prominent. But as a normative matter, when delivering, deliberating our, our cultural conflicts, a concern with recognition alone, in the sense of struggles for relative esteem, is unlikely to give us much assistance. Indeed, I suspect it is most likely to operate when what is most an issue is inclusion. And then recognition is likely to cleave very close to recognition of equal political membership, though a rich conception of membership in which people continue to carry their differences. Um, it's likely, in other words, to pray, play a role primarily as a remedy for exclusion. But in more complex cultural conflicts, where a claim relates to the accommodation of difference, recognition alone is likely to play very little role. If anything, it will uh, be an acknowledgement, amount to an acknowledgement that there is a problem to be dealt with, that we are not the same. It will be the barest of first steps. But then the hard work begins. And I think if we continue to use recognition, we're likely to be using it in the first sense that I mentioned, really uh, in the catch-all sense. That hard work is the work of understanding the differences of normative language, the differences of perspective that those differences of language give rise to. The exploration 
of the deliberative communities that exist across those lines or within those lines, and finally, the attempt to fit political institutions to that complex federal assortment of deliberative communities. That has been what has, that is, it seems to me, what has been at the heart of all of Charles Taylor's grappling with cultural difference. Indeed, it's been at the heart of his life as a citizen who loves deeply the societies that have formed him and that he has in turn done so much to explain and to transform. I certainly, in every line of my work, have been shaped by his wisdom and by his example.